Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual presentation of What Strange Paradise with author Omar El Akkad and our moderator, Lainey Zumas. Uh, we have signed book plates available for those who purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Uh, to request one, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer's screen. It will take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. Uh, just make sure to write signed book plate in the order comments so uh, we know that we should reserve that for you. Also, there is an audience Q&A included in this event. To submit a question, just click on the Ask a Question button at the very bottom of the screen. You can also vote for any question you'd like, and the more popular questions will uh, make their way to the very top of the list. All right, so with that said, let me introduce our guests, and then we can get started. So. Omar El Akkad is the author of American War, an international best-selling novel that has been translated into 13 languages. It was named as one of the best books of 2017 by New York Times, The Washington Post, NPR, and was also selected by the BBC as one of the 100 novels that shaped our world. As a journalist, he has reported from Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and many other locations around the world. And joining him tonight is our moderator, Lainey Zumas. She is the author of the national best-selling novel, Red Clocks, which was a New York Times book review editor's choice and was named a best book of 2018 by The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Huffington Post, and the New York Public Library. So with that said, I'm gonna turn my camera off and turn things over to Lainey. Enjoy the talk, everyone. Thanks, Vera. And, um... Hi, Omar. I'm really happy to be in conversation with you about this book. Um, for those in the audience who have not read it yet, uh, it is what is sometimes called a page turner. Um, I I would have read it in one sitting if I, my sort of the demands of my ordinary life had not uh, interrupted me. But it's uh, it's a it's really mesmerizing book, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about how you made it. Um, so um, would you start us out by reading a little from it and then I can launch in to ask you a little bit about the book? Sure. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for doing this. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Red Clocks, please pick it up. It is a spectacular piece of work. Um, and this is very inside baseball because uh, Lainey and I are both out here in Oregon. Uh, but it won the Oregon Book Award against some very, very stiff competition and uh, did so deservedly. Um, so I wrote a book. It's called What Strange Paradise. Um, it is a repurposed fable of sorts. Um, it's a story of Peter Pan reinterpreted as a, as a story of a contemporary child refugee. Um, the book starts with um, a nine-year-old boy named Amir who uh, washes up on the shore of an unnamed Western island uh, the only survivor of a migrant shipwreck. And then the chapters alternate after that, uh, after and before. The after chapters are what happens once he gets to the island, and the before chapters are how he ended up there in the first place. Um, so I'm just going to uh, read you the first sort of couple of pages, just um, from the beginning of chapter one. The child lies on the shore. All around him, the beach is littered with the wreckage of the boat and the wreckage of its passengers. Shards of decking, knapsacks cleaved and gutted, bodies frozen in unnatural contortion. Dispossessed of nightfall's temporary burial, the dead ferment in decency. There's too much of spring in the day, too much light. Face down with his arms outstretched, the child appears from a distance as though playing at flight. And so too in the bodies that surround him, though distended with seawater and hardening, there flicker the remnants of some silent levitation, a severance from the laws of being. The sea is tranquil now, the storm has passed. The island, despite the debris, is calm. A pair of plump orange-necked birds, stragglers from a northbound flock, take rest on the lamppost from which hangs one end of a police cordon. In the breaks between the wailing of the sirens and the murmur of the onlookers, they can be heard singing. The species is not unique to the island, nor the island to the species, but the birds, when they stop here, change the pitch of their songs. The call is an octave higher, a sharp, throat-scraping thing. 
In time, a crowd gathers near the site of the shipwreck, tourists and locals alike. People watch. The eldest of them, an arthritic fisherman driven in recent years by plummeting cherub fish stocks to kitchen work at a nearby resort, says that it's never been like this before on the island. Other locals nod because even though the history of this place is that of violent endings, of galleys flipped over the axis of their oars and fishing skiffs tangled in their own netting, and once during the war, an empty Higgins lander sheared to ribbons by shrapnel, the old man is still in his own way right. These are foreign dead. No one can remember exactly when they first started washing up along the eastern coast, but in the last year it has happened with such frequency that many of the nations on whose tourists the island's economy depends have issued travel advisories. The hotels and resorts, in turn, have offered discounts. Between them, the Coast Guard and the Moor keep a partial count of the dead, and as of this morning, it stands at 1,026, but this number is as much an abstraction as the dead themselves are to the people who live here, to whom all the shipwrecks of the previous year are a single shipwreck, all the bodies a single body. Three officers from the municipal police force pull a long strip of caution tape along the breadth of the walkway that leads from the road to the beach. Another three wrestle with large sheets of blue boat cover canvas, trying to build a curtain between the dead and their audience. In this way, the destruction takes on an air of queer unreality, a stage play bled of movement, a fairy tale upturned. The officers, all of them young and impatient, manage to tether the fabric to a couple of lampposts from which the orange-necked birds whistle and flee. But even stretched to near tearing, the canvas does little to hide the dead from view. Some of the onlookers shuffle awkwardly to the far end of the parking lot, where there's still an acute line of sight between the draping and four television news trucks. Others climb on top of parked cars and sweep their cameras across the width of the beach, some with their backs to the carnage, their own faces occupying the center of the recording. The dead become the property of the living. Oriented as they are, many of the shipwrecked bodies appear to have been spat up landward by the sea, or of their own volition to have walked out from its depths and then collapsed a few feet later. Except the child. Relative to the others, he is inverted, his head closest to the lapping waves, his feet nestled into the warmer, lighter sand that remains dry even at highest tide. He is small, but somewhere along the length of his body marks the sea's furthest reach. A wave brushes gently against the child's hair. He opens his eyes. As I'm listening, and, and uh, when I first read that on the page, that, that opening, I thought about uh, Susan Sontag's essay regarding the pain of others, this um, real attention that you're giving to what happens um, when a human being becomes an abstraction and, and when there's a spectacle of suffering that is staged in such a way that the people watching don't they might sort of feel something for a second, but they're actually, but they're not truly asked to be involved. And um, could you talk a bit about how th throughout the book, this idea of spectacle and and sort of um, almost presentation or or stagedness um, is affecting the lives of these characters? Yeah, I'm thinking I might have the wrong Sontag essay, but I think that's the one that opens up with. Um, her describing a correspondence between Virginia Woolf and that lawyer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and her trying to, Virginia Woolf trying to explain to this lawyer, we're looking at entirely different things. You and I we're experiencing an entirely different interpretation of this, of, of what I think it was war, what essentially what yeah. human suffering entails. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking about that a lot. It was actually one of, one of the books that I read during the, the period that I was, that I was um, writing this, this novel this notion that on the interpreting side, this thing is many different things. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to deal with that. And a lot of this book is, is framed or comes from a place of not knowing, I think. Um, I also don't know if I have the right to be doing this at all. I, I think one of the things about being a journalist, I spent 10 years as a journalist, 
you're in these places and you're watching absolute ruin. I mean, we were on the outskirts of Kandahar and you're watching what a place looks like when it's been on the receiving end of war for 40 years. But you get to leave at the end. And no matter how much, you know, how well developed your empathy muscles are or sort of how well you interpret it or how well-meaning you are, you still get to leave. And you'll, you'll never bridge that, that gap. And so one of the things I could do as a journalist is convince myself that that, that sense of being a tourist in someone else's misery is offset by the good that this, in, this documenting of history will do. Maybe someone will read this article, and uh, I worked in Canada at the time, maybe somebody on Parliament Hill was going to read this and it'll change their position on something. Maybe something will get done. It's much harder to do that in any kind of tangible sense when you're making stuff up for a living. Um, you have to tether yourself to a much more abstract and kind of amorphous definition of, of what literature can do and what your writing can do. Um, and it's becoming more and more difficult for me to to even pretend that those two things balance. And, and so I, I, I don't know if I can write these books anymore, um, but this is what I felt I needed to write and I wrote it. Um, it's, it's a very close book. The, 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 you, the camera's right here sort of thing. Um, and when you do that, it's a weird tightrope to walk. You overdo it and it, it fails in a certain way. And if you're too cavalier about it, it fails in a different way. And I think you can see the places in the book where I sort of wobbled off one end or the other. Um, but the entire act of writing it was, was sort of trying to walk that tightrope as much as, as much as possible. I really appreciate you talking about not knowing and, and being uncertain and being and questioning as you were writing. And even now, um, you know, what can literature do or what, what, what is the place um, or position of a writer who is engaging with some of the most urgent and intense suffering that's going on in our world? Um, which this book is doing, right? There, there's, although, you know, we have this boy, Amir, who's this nine-year-old boy um, you're following, and then um, a slightly older girl on the island, Vana, who befriends him after. So, so like their friendship is extremely intimate and and sort of, as you say, the camera is is right on them. But also what we're, what we're looking at and experiencing are, is the sort of, uh, like catastrophe of of capitalism and globalization and um, and climate crisis and and all sorts of things that are on such a massive scale that um, if one is lucky enough, uh, not through any virtue of their own, but fortunate to not um, be right up against it, like there's a way in which you know there can be a kind of tourism. Um, in thinking about it or looking at it and, and tourists are really important in this book. Like this, this hotel that is, is on the Island, um, which is kind of, to me, the most sinister sort of apparatus, like in the whole book, like this, this idea that, you know, people just want to come to this beautiful Greek Island and not have to look at things that are unpleasant um, or be reminded of them. But so, so kind of thinking about that and that the, the discomfort, of being a writer who is is reaching into these questions how did you come to start writing the book like what you know what made you overcome that discomfort to, to write it um the the earliest memory i have of something that sort of led to the um led to me thinking about the things that eventually congealed into this book basically was um 2012 was the last time i was back in egypt uh, i was born in egypt my, my family's all from there and I grew up in the Middle East, so we were back and forth between Qatar, where I grew up in Egypt for, for years and years and years. The last time I was there was in 2012, and I was on assignment for my old newspaper. And I was covering um, the aftermath of the Arab Spring. And I was riding around with an old high school buddy. We were driving around Cairo, and he was complaining about rent. Prices are too high. Rent is too high. Rent is too high. And um, at one point I asked him, you know, so what like give me an example like in your building what's what's the average rent for an apartment in your building and he said uh well do you mean the locals price or do you mean the syrians price and i said well, what the hell's the syrians price and he said well we've had this influx of people coming in uh and they don't have paperwork they don't have anything they don't have a choice so you can charge them about three times as much you can sort of squeeze them for all they're worth 
well, what are they going to do? Like go somewhere else? And it quickly became apparent that that this wasn't just an apartments thing. This was like when you went down to get fruits and vegetables from the stall down the street. It was a similar um, calculus. And this is in the context of all the Arab leaders, all the, all the leaders of the Arab nations going around talking about our Syrian brothers and sisters, our Syrian brothers and sisters. It's all, it's all bullshit. Uh, it, it, on the ground, there was a population that was fit to be exploited, and so they were going to be exploited. Um, and then a couple of years later, I was I was reading about a uh, migrant shipwreck, uh, the ship that had capsized along the Mediterranean, and the details were about as you know horrific as, as you would expect. But one of the things I remember about that particular story is that it came with it provoked so much outrage in this part of the world for about 24 hours. And then everybody moved on to the next thing to be outraged about. And so, you know, I can't tell you if this is a good or bad book, but, but it is very much written in the, it's very much written against that idea, against that privilege of instantaneous forgetting, against this notion in this part of the world that you are, a, you can be a good progressive so long as you're sufficiently outraged about the thing and then move on and become sufficiently outraged about the next thing and, and continue um, forever. And I wanted to do the opposite of that. I wanted to dwell. Um, so those are the two memories that sort of got me thinking about the things that eventually became became the novel. Mm -hmm. And once you, you started it, um, how were you thinking about structure? Because the, the structure, um, as a fellow writer, um, what's really... Um, exciting to me um, about the book on a on a craft level on a sort of as a made thing is how the the two strands of narrative you described are are behaving together um, and how they're working and so one of the things you know in my kind of double consciousness as I was reading I'm like oh at what point did Omar like come to this structure like when did he decide to like call this before and after and now, you know, like, um, so can you talk a little bit about how you arrived at the the form that it, it takes now? Yeah, so, so um, from very early on, from the very beginning, I knew I wanted to follow Peter Pan. I knew I wanted to take this comforting fable that Westerners had been telling their kids for the last hundred years, and I wanted to invert it and sort of in the process, bring it back to its something like its roots, because when we talk about Peter Pan, we today we usually talk about the the man who refuses to stop acting like a like a child. You know, Peter Pan syndrome, that kind of thing. The origins are the opposite. Uh, J. M. Barrie's older brother died, uh, I believe it was in a skating accident when he was thirteen, and it crushed the family. His mom never recovered, um, and it heavily influenced years later the, the construction of Peter Pan as this boy who won't grow old. Um, and so at the beginning, once I had that container, once I had that structural container, I did what I always do, which is sort of handcuff myself to it. And it's like, I'm going to stick to every single, you know, um, it was the same number of chapters. I, I sort of wedged it into it because I needed to have, you know, 17 in the original. It's going to be 17. It did not work at all. Like the, the chapter breaks were just jarring at best. Um, and then... I started to sort of loosen it up over time. Um, and during that process was when I decided on before and after. I, I like that that sort of, and I mean, there's there's sort of like the very, very obvious literary tricks that run throughout that the, the after chapters are present tense, the before chapters are past, you know, that, that kind of thing, which is not particularly clever on my part. But um, I, at one point, I actually had another element in there, which was, um, these monologues from each of the passengers on the migrant ship oh. uh, explaining their backstories. And to be honest, I love that on a writing level. Like I loved writing these things. They absolutely did not work on a structural level. It was one too many elements. And I think every writer has been in, in that place where you're like, Nope, this is, mm -hmm. this is turning into a kitchen sink kind of thing. Um, so I took those out, but in the process of writing them, I became much closer to these people. And, and so that just, just on a character level, helped out quite a bit, even though, you know, hitting delete on, on what was about 30,000 words was, was not, um, not, not my happiest moment as a writer, but, um, it clearly wasn't working. Uh, and then it was just sort of, I, it's a short book. And I think the longer I worked, the longer I, I work on it, I think it would have been even shorter. I had to at some point sort of, um, let it go, but, um, it's, 
it's one of those books I keep talking about Peter Pan, Peter Pan. If, if you're not intimately familiar with that story and the backstory of its writing, it, 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 there's an epigraph from Peter Pan and that's about it. Like the rest of everything else in there is sort of hidden into the text and not, not particularly overt. Um, and so that was the other thing that I was trying to do was structurally, I sort of welded myself to, to the original Peter Pan fable. But in terms of overt description or references, I, I wanted as much as possible to at least let it be readable if you didn't know any of that stuff, if you weren't going in with any kind of knowledge of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what you're describing, that kind of commitment to a structure, it's interesting because the, the, the it feels like on a, a the sort of like for the perspective of the reading experience, extremely um, organic to 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 a small amount of time with with a, a small cast of characters that, um, and I love like thinking about the kind of the, the deep structure that that went into it for you, um, which which I think must have affected the the stitched together feeling like 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 in a in a good sense like it it feels of a of a piece right um, and I just I'm fascinated by the fact that it was kind of taken from like another um, kind of story scaffolding. But um, I wonder, like you you mentioned kind of the, the, the idea starting from a visit to Egypt and some of your work as a journalist, like, can you talk a little bit more about how the, the sort of investigation that a journalist does, like how that intersects with your investigations as a fiction writer, if at all, like, you know, or, or how does it sort of separate from it? Like, what are the intersections? So I, um, so here's, here's the story of my first week at the Globe and Mail, my first week on the job. I was like 23, maybe even younger. I don't know. Anyway, I got hired at the Globe and Mail, which is the national paper up in Canada. And they hired me as a summer intern. And then they gave me the short term contract. And in the summer of 2006, they were like, fine, we're going to hire you on. Um, and I was thrilled because I have no marketable talents whatsoever. And so um, I have a computer science degree. I can't, I can't program my way out of a paper bag. I have no idea how to do anything. So this, somebody was offering me a job. I was thrilled. Um, so I get hired on, on a Monday in the summer of 2006. And on that Friday, the biggest terrorism arrest in Canadian history go down. This thing called the Toronto 18 case, which was these 18 kids. Some of them were kids. Some of them were like 17 years old who had all these grand plans to like behead the prime minister and bomb parliament hill and all of this and none of it none of it happened they were being watched the whole time by by our our version of the fbi so on that friday they swoop in arrest all of these guys it becomes the biggest story in the world for about a week the biggest story in canada for about a year and the globe and mail which again is like the new york times of canada gets beaten on this story um badly the other major newspapers in in the country have full a1 coverage um, and we have this tiny item on A2, this brief. We got beaten so bad that anyone who wants to do this can look it up. The New York Times wrote a story about how badly the Globe and Mail got beaten on, on this, which is which is rare. It's rare that you mess up in journalism so badly that another newspaper writes about it. Anyway, our editor-in-chief is, is, is very angry, calls an all-hands-on-deck meeting the following Monday. And he's looking around for anybody who's familiar with the Middle East, because that's where some of these kids' parents came from, anybody who's familiar with Islam. He's looking for brown people. And in a newsroom of 300, he finds two of us. He finds me, and he finds Kamel, the theater critic. <laughs> he calls us over, and he says, you two, you're going to go to the mosques where these kids went. You're going to do some street reporting. You're going to go. I'm like, all right, this is what I do. I'm a Toronto street reporter. That's what I do. So I go to one of the mosques. Kamel, the theater critic, goes to another mosque. We come back. I'm writing my file. Kamel sends me his file. And it's 500 of the most beautiful words I've ever read about the acoustics inside mm -hmm. the building and the, the the texture of the velvet drapes because he's a goddamn theater critic who just happens to be, who just happens to be Brown. Right. So that was the start of two years of my life on that story. Um, I'm trying to figure out how these kids came from this very suburban benign background and went to like, you know, building detonators off YouTube videos. The process of doing all of that stuff and the process, every single big story I worked on in my career leaves you with, um, it leaves you with this residual information that you don't know what to do with. Mm. You know, journalism, by definition, is about answers. Who, what, where, when, how. If you don't have 
those answers, you don't have a piece of journalism. But you're left with all of these experiences that, that don't fit in that context. And so during the span of my journalism career, I wrote three novels before American War. Then I wrote American War. Um, all of that was heavily informed by all this stuff that I couldn't turn into answers. Um, and so there's nothing really prescriptive about any of the fiction I write. There's nothing really sort of, and if we do X, Y, Z, everything will turn out fine. I, I, I just skip that part entirely. Um, but I'm not sure I'll ever write anything in my life, any piece of fiction that isn't somehow informed by this kind of baggage that you carry around from, from all the stuff that you couldn't mold into a straightforward answer to a question. Yeah. Well, and also the idea of, you know, a, a newspaper editor in a room of 300 people being like, okay, the two brown guys, like you're, you're you know, like go do the thing. I, I mean, the, the way um, race is manifesting and like how you're handling it in uh, What Strange Paradise is really, really interesting um, because one of the things you're disrupting is a kind of um, easy or like reductive racialization of uh of migrants of of refugees um there's a an you know and sort of like the idea of like the immigrant experience quote unquote like that sort of really simplistic and like um extremely racialized uh sort of formula that often appears in representations of migration um because the the character vana um i i would you tell us about that character and how, because the way she's functioning um, in terms of like her whiteness um, and, and her like immigrant or, or daughter of immigrant status is, is pretty fascinating. Yeah, so, so Vanna is, um, I mean, the heart of the book is this relationship between nine-year-old Amir who washes up on this island and Vanna who's 15, who's, who's, um, who, who's from this island, but she's, I don't know how explicitly I make this clear in the book, but she's half, half, Greek, half Swedish, but the island itself is a fantasy place. So I never go into those sort of details, but she comes from sort of two, two different backgrounds. And she is someone who's having a real hard time coming to terms with, with what goodness looks like for her, what, what being a decent human being um, looks like. And then suddenly she's thrown into a situation where there's this nine-year-old boy. She has no idea where the hell he's from. And, um, and she, she decides to help him. She decides to take that step of going against the authorities and going against what her own parents would say and going against the sort of norms of this island place to help this child that she knows nothing about. She doesn't know where he's from or anything like that. Um, but she's still, I mean, for me, she's, she's an example of somebody struggling with the asymmetry of kindness. You know, if you're, if you're lending somebody a hand, you are by definition above them sort of and she's born into that and she understands that she's born into that but throughout this relationship there's still that sense of the overriding principle here is that i be a good person that i be the person who did the right thing and there's immense goodness that comes from that in terms of her actions and what she does but it's still from a place of and this is what a good person would do. So I'm going to do this. And this is the end result. And even if it, it requires lying to this child or whatever it requires, the, the sort of ends justify the means. And the ends are very much tied in with this idea of, and then I will be able to think of myself as a decent human being. Um, so she's, she's, to me, that's what she's struggling with throughout, throughout the course of the novel. Um, in terms of sort of racial aspect of it, it's, it's, you know, one of the things that at least I struggle with is is this idea of, you know, I'm a, I'm a brown guy, I'm a Muslim guy living in the States. When I see people who look like me in most of culture, most of popular culture in this part of the world, it's either you're the bad guy who's a terrorist, uh, you're the good guy who helps Jack Bauer catch the terrorist, or you're a fruit and vegetable vendor whose stall gets destroyed in a Matt Damon car chase. That's kind of the, the entirety of the, the setup, right? And so when you're writing and you're touching on issues that are related even tangentially to your own identity, there is such a tendency and such a sort of magnetic pull to try and offset all of that by making your characters pure as the driven snow. And, and if you can just make them good enough, they can offset all of that. And I, I try as much as possible to, um, 
to step aside that. Um, and I mean, again, I don't, I, I don't know if I do it well or not, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that I'm thinking about a lot of the time is um, you're not required to carry the entirety of your experience into the work and you're not, in, you're not required to offset whatever the hell has been done structurally in your individual work. Those are, those two things don't, don't, they can never fix one another. It's not, it's not how that's right. going to work. Well, I mean, I think one area of the book, you are doing it extremely well and, um, and with really powerful results is the group of characters who's on the boat with Amir, the Calypso, um, and the, I, the, the cast of characters you, you wrote the, the monologues for, and then chucked them out. Um, I really, I relate to that pain a lot. Um, could you kind of, for, for people who haven't read the book yet, give a sense of, of some of the, like the sort of the cast on the boat? Because I think the, the way that those characters are speaking to each other and functioning is really disrupting this, this kind of like, um, kind of like sense of trope or caricature or, uh, or, or, or virtuous, you know, overcomer, right? Yeah. So, um, thank you for that. I, 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 um, I don't steal whole people generally. I, I steal sort of traits, uh, and, and mash them together and hope that it works. Um, and, um, I, I, all of these people on the boat are, they're carrying with them something that I saw in somebody that I grew up around. Um, and in some cases it's a sense of virtue. Um, there's a guy on the boat, this Palestinian guy named Mara, who just wants to be left alone to read. That's all he wants to do. It's just, I want one of my books and please leave me alone. Um, and then this guy named Walid, who's, who's essentially a coward at his core. He is very much a coward, um, but he's wrapped it up in, in this very dignified presence. Um, and, you know, they, one of the strange things about sort of writing that part of it is, is that a lot of these folks are Arab on the boat. And in my head, all of this dialogue is happening in Arabic. And then I'm translating it. And I think, I mean, that's not, I'm still 50-50 on whether that's the correct decision or not, but it was how it was happening on my head. Um, and, I, and, and so there's a couple of phrases and uses of language that are very much from the original Arabic, that that's how it would have been said sort of thing. Um, but then you fall into that age old question of like, do I italicize certain words and then explain what they are? Do I, you know, how open am I going to make It's sort of the, the breadth versus depth argument, right? Of, of like, do I make this sort of accessible to a wide variety of people at the, uh, at the expense of sort of, you know, at, at the cost of over explaining, or do I make it such that the person who gets it, gets it. Um, Translation versus immersion. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a, the, the go-to example in this book, which is, um, well, I mean, you'll hear it. Uh, so, so at the beginning of, of the story, uh, at one point, Vanna is, um, she, she's very upset at the nightclub down by the shore. This is sort of a tourist trap of an island. Um, and there's this nightclub and has been playing the same rap song like over and over again every night, right? And, and it's never sort of explicitly stated in the book, but if you read between the lines, it's a song called Big Pimpin' by Jay-Z. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Fast forward to the other end of the book, uh, this migrant ship is in the middle of a storm and everybody's panicking and somebody says, hold on, hold on. One of the Arabs on the boat says, I hear something. They're playing our music. There must be Arabs nearby. They're playing our song. They're playing this thing called Khusara Khusara. Well, <laughs> Big Pimpin' by Jay-Z samples a mid-20th century Egyptian pop song mm. called, called Khusara Khusara. The, the, the Venn diagram of people whose cultural knowledge includes... Jay-Z's back catalog and mid 20th century pop music is, is those circles don't live anywhere near each other. And so at some point you, you have to make the determination of, of how open do I want to make that door? And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer to any of this. It's just one of those things that I was thinking about a lot is this idea of you're walking another kind of tightrope, right? If, if, if they see it, it was too obvious. And if they don't see it, it was never there. 
and and I try to sort of walk somewhere in between that, and I'm constantly falling off one, you know, on one side or another. But it, but it's something I was thinking about a lot when I was when I was putting this particular novel together. Are, are the like what do you think the most important decisions were that you made around that? Um, whether at the sentence level in terms of italicization or versus not, or kind of in a, in a macro way, like. What do you think are the decisions that are most important to how the book turned out? Um, I think I very much decided I was going to err on the side of um, the, the surface of the lake was going to be one thing and the stuff that's buried in the lake bed is going to be something, but I'm not throwing buoys tethered from one, you know, from the surface down to the bottom. I'm not doing that. And again, I'm not saying that was a correct decision to make, but it's just, it was it was an it was an active decision on my part. There's you know at one point Amir Amir gets on this boat at the beginning by accident. He doesn't know what the hell's going on. It's it's a misunderstanding and he ends up on this boat. And um, right around the scene where that happens, um, there's these young men who are walking down the Corniche in Alexandria and they see what's happening, and they make this. Uh, well, they're just they're a bunch of idiots and they make they make they make they make a, a, a silly joke. Um, that is completely indecipherable if you don't speak Arabic, and I, I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, I don't explain that. Um, it was that kind of, it was going to be that kind of book, for better or worse. Uh, I decided early on, and so once I made that decision, I had to, I had to balance in my head those two pieces of writing, the the, the, the lake surface piece of writing, and then the stuff I was putting in the lake bed. That's a horrible metaphor. It's not, it's not working at all. I'm sorry. Um, but you get the idea of what I'm like sort of trying to, yeah. and that, you know, the, the surface story had to work um, at, the, at the expense of, of almost anything else, but that I could give myself that lake bed to sort of put what I wanted into it. Once I made that decision, I, I wasn't going to stray from it for better or worse. Mm -hmm. And how much are you thinking as you write or as you revise or a different about audience, like about, um, you know, you mentioned the Venn diagram of people who would like, you know, know a Jay Z song, and then this like mid-century like um, song that's like very much not an American like hip hop song. So, what are do you have? Uh, um, are you just ignoring the idea of audience at all while you're drafting, or are you thinking about like when, if at all, are you thinking about like who your readers are going to be? It's a really good question. I, I didn't, I had the sort of privilege of not having to think too deeply about stuff like this with the first novel, with American War, because um, when I wrote it, I had no publisher or agent or book deal. I had no expectation it would ever see the light of day. And in fact, it just stayed on my hard drive for months after I wrote it. I wasn't planning to, to show it to anybody. Um, and so I had to think a little less about you know, what, what would X think of this? What would Y think of this? What would the people I respect or whose opinion I respect, excuse me, what they would think of this. And with this novel, there was, I had to keep slamming the door shut on, on all of that noise about how this relates to the folks whose opinion I respected, who maybe really liked American war, um, or who had a particular interpretation of my writing based on American war and what this would do to that. Um, because to me, thematically, they're very similar, but they're also very different books. Mm -hmm. um, so that was taking up a lot of room in my brain. And I I didn't know what to do with that. It was, it was messing with me a little bit. Um, my first reader on all my projects, the three thoroughly unpublishable bad novels that came before American War, American War and this thing, uh, my first reader is, um, my friend Anna, who's a, she's an investigative reporter up in Canada. She uh, she works at Reuters up there, and so generally, I tend to think of what she's going to catch. She's a very analytical reader, and so my first drafts are always like braced in self defense against someone with a very very strong logical component of their brain who's going to catch all of the places where the gears aren't quite fitting in together. Um, and then I think of of my agent Anne. Who, who's very much an emotional reader and, and mm -hmm. will, will give me a pretty honest assessment of whether this is doing anything on, um, on an emotional level. Um, but to, 
as much as possible, I try not to, I try not to have them sitting on my shoulders when I write. Um, all I'm really trying for, uh, I'm going to phrase this very badly, but, but you, when you, when you're writing, when I'm writing, I'm, I'm trying to get to the place and I can't describe the place. And I can't, I can tell you that it feels, there's a certain level of effortlessness when you reach the, and I reach the place maybe like once or twice a novel where you write a paragraph and you're like, ah, I was in the place. I didn't know it at the time, but I was in the place. Um, and that requires really not thinking about the act. It requires the act, but not thinking about the act. It's sort of like hitting a putt in golf. As soon as you start hit, thinking about it, that thing's going, going sideways. So as much as I can, I try to keep that side completely out of the Once there's a draft, then all those voices come come rushing in. And I think, oh, how would this person read it? How would this person read it? But I'm wondering, I mean, do you have do you have a, a reader in mind? Do you have when you when you go into your projects or do they show up later? Well, I, I mean, I really relate to what, what you just described, like the the sort of necessity of like shoving everything away while you, while I'm writing, because the minute I start thinking about like, you know, an old writing mentor, like or a writing mentor of mine who, you know, would dissect this sentence and be like, uh, cut that sentence. Like if, if I stop and think that, then the sentence doesn't get finished. Um, but I also, I, I sort of have an agreement with myself in a way that like, I'll think about it later because otherwise it's terrifying, you know, just to like not have any sort of sense of audience. Um, and especially I think when I am, and, and you know this this so much relates to what strange paradise because you you i mean it's all in in third person and often like a very close third um on on some of the central characters but you know including uh maybe secondary characters like a like this military guy on the island who is hunting for amir right and and so one of the things that i really struggle with and and i was so interested in how you you did in this novel um is kind of inhabiting a self um that is pretty far from one's own experience but not kind of not like dwelling in that self but but not kind of colonizing it so to speak like um I mean, I think what you do, like you kind of mentioned earlier in this conversation, like wanting to have a sort of lighter touch with and and, and not um, uh, not sort of overwhelm like any of the characters uh, sort of presentations with like long monologues or, or kind of like an interiority that would like sort of swamp the book. And and I think it's kind of, it's, it's really exquisite, like how you've, um, pulled that off um, because it's not that we're really far away from the characters so that everyone seems like a type or, or, but, but the book is also not insisting on, you know, the reader getting to know everything about every single character, you know, um, it's not saying like, Oh, okay. I'm going to explain this, this military guy to you. Like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a Wikipedia dump of like the, you know, the war experiences that, in which he lost his leg. And it's, it's not that at all. Like you're really restrained in um, kind of how, how you're, it's, it's gentle. I, I think how we, we are allowed to accompany these characters. Um, and I just, yeah, I just wanted to say how much I admire that because I, I think um, there's a lot of moving parts in this book that, I think, again, thinking as a as a writer, like how how you navigated that. Um, but I also so question wise, since we're wrapping up soon, there's a question from a reader. Um, it says, Omar, in American War, you took on a story large in scope from the geography, the time frame, and the cast of characters. What Strange Paradise is much closer experience, tighter lens, time frame, location. Can you talk about how different the processes were in creating these two very different yet thematically linked books? Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, Julie, who, who asked that question, is an incredible writer, by the way. Um, please go look up her work. Um, she's, she's really spectacular. Um, I was, I was um, thinking a little bit about if I'm fortunate enough to actually have a continuing career, um, 
of, of writing fiction, my hope is that you could put a sticker on every new novel that says like, if you love the previous one, you're going to hate this thing. <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, they, they, it's a strange place to be. It's, it's um, because American War was this book that I, I thought was going to be read one way. I thought it was going to be read as an inversion, as the, the telling of another people's story superimposed onto the most powerful country on earth. And um, instead, it was read very much as an American story um, because it came out four months into the Trump administration. And, you know, that, that was sort of um, where, where the country was. It was in a place where it was going to read this book as prophecy about how a second civil war was going to go down. And uh, this is where we're headed if we're not careful and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is not at all what I intended. And I thought that by going to this place, once I decided on a very sort of short, quiet, close book, that is, it's, 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 it doesn't yell as much as American War. I thought that it would be interpreted the way I hoped. Um, and the first four people who read the draft of this manuscript, manuscript had four entirely different interpretations of what the hell was going on in this book. Um, and it sort of blew my mind. Uh, when I was younger, I was, that that messed me up. I, I really didn't enjoy that feeling. Um, because look, I, I write, besides writing Stone Cold Bummer after Stone Cold Bummer, I also write like deeply political books. That's just, you know, for better or worse. And there's a lot of writers, including a lot of writers who I respect, who are immediately turned off by that. That for them is completely separate from the literary craft and that's perfectly fine. Um, but that's not what I do. For better or worse, I write these books. And when you're writing these books, you want desperately to be understood for a certain thing and you have to let go of that. Those four interpretations are so much more valid than whatever the hell I intended this book to be. And I very much subscribe to, I mean, that's an idea that um, I first heard from Borges, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, this notion that once it leaves your hands, does not matter in the slightest what you what you intended it to be. My reading of it as the reader is what counts. Um, and once I bought into that, it made it it made it much easier to to sort of not commit to American War Part Two, and and to go to this particular place. Um, and uh, we will find out if Knopf never buys another novel from me. We will find out if this was a good or bad decision on a career level, but. Um, I, I, I really do gravitate to this idea of going to an entirely different place structurally, uh, going to an entirely different place in tone um, and in narrative and all the rest of it. Um, I think if I'm ever churning out the thing that worked the last time, um, then I think I'm, I'm sort of wasting everybody's time. I'm really excited for everyone to read this one. Um, whether or not they have expectations from American War, um, it's a great book. Uh, and I think we're sort of coming to the end of our time. Um, is there anything, I don't know, Omar, anything else you want uh, folks to know about the book, like who haven't, who haven't read it yet? Um, no, just one, one last thing. Uh, Red Clocks is a masterpiece. Please, please pick it up. Um, it's an incredible book. Uh, Lainey, thank you so much for doing this. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Total pleasure. Thank and you, thank Lainey. you for writing this book. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lainey. Thank you, Omar, for uh, such an insightful talk. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Again, we do have signed book plates available. So if you would like one, just click on the green purchase button. It'll take you to our website. Uh, just make sure to write signed book plate in the order comments when you're checking out your cart. And for those of you who tuned in late, don't worry, a replay of this talk will be available shortly. Just use the same Crowdcast link. And I think that about covers it. Um, have a good night, everyone, and stay safe. Right. Thank you, Vera. Right, bye. Thanks so much.